Okay. Welcome to the Golden Mean, everybody. I have a dear friend and somebody who's been covering this coronavirus story every day for weeks now. Um, and he's also covered a ton of other things in his broadcasting career. He's done sports. He's done news. His name is Raj Mathai. He is the, was the sports director at first for many years at NBC in San Francisco. Uh, for almost a decade, he has been the news anchor, 5, 6, 11, and covering everything under the sun um, when it comes to news and not just local. He is a 10-time Emmy winner. I don't want to embarrass him. He's a 10-time Emmy winner. Uh, and I was there for five years in the trenches in Fresno, California at NBC, watching this guy practice his craft. And believe me, myself and other people in the newsroom, we knew there was no question that he was going wherever he wanted to go. It was a matter of time. That's how talented Raj was. He's also a dear friend, even though 20 years separates us living in the same city. Thanks for doing this today, my friend. No problem. My pleasure, Michael. I'm glad to be on. Uh, I love that you're doing this um, because it's engaging for all of us journalistically and, uh, and just your topics that you cover are great. So it's, it's my pleasure to be here. I wish it was on better terms and better circumstances, but uh, I guess there's no better time than right now. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. And it's amazing. I've been doing this show for three and a half years and haven't had you on yet. Your, your schedule is so breakneck, your pace. Um, uh, but this seems like just the perfect time to do it. And we'll talk about all kinds of things. But I want to start, I want to start with this coronavirus. And especially, look, you're in Northern California. You, you grew up out there, Los Altos High School. So actually, you know, in a way, you will get to that. But you're living the dream, broadcasting in your own uh, hometown city, which is the third or fifth largest market in the country. I can't remember. But Northern California really kind of set the pace many, many, many days ago now. Um, by doing the first, whatever you want to call it, sh shelter in place. Now they're calling it stay at home uh, orders. And I've been arguing for that for two weeks. I do not understand how we did not lose, learn the lessons of both China and what Italy's going through right now. But tell me about how that started in Northern California, the mayors, uh, um, the county board before it got to the, the state. And, and are people following it out there? Give, give, us a, give us a feel for your region. Look, we've never gone through anything like this. And what's been fascinating this whole last five to six weeks, and, and out here in the Bay Area, it's been five to six weeks. I know it's taken a while for New York and Texas and Illinois to get on board, but that's okay, that's natural. But we've been going through this for several weeks. And our people following the orders, we're all learning at the same time, Michael. This is not something that we've gone through this is the story of our generation, of our lifetime. Yeah. And you know, I love to talk to people in good scenarios and in trying scenarios um, that are 70 plus and older. And when you talk to your 70 and 80 year olds right now, they have gone through something like this with World War II and even the Great Depression when they were kids. None of us have gone through it. So it's all new to us. And to answer your question, are people following the order? Sort of, and I think they're doing a pretty good job. Uh, but I know just yesterday, uh, our beaches here were flooded with visitors and that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And I think it's kind of a lesson learned by all of us. Okay, we can keep our distance, we can keep six feet, but if there's a two hour traffic jam to get to the beach, you're not going to shelter uh, in, in the right spot. You're not taking your daily walk in the right spot. So we are learning, this is all new to us and it's gonna start going all over the country, but we're kind of learning in progress here. You know, I don't know about you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm not surprised. Look, for, for years I've wondered, and we, we had H1N1, we had the, you know, we've, we had the AIDS epidemic to be sure. But in the last 20 years, in this century, I've been surprised that two things haven't happened uh, more often or at all. The first is something like this, where it's a fast spreading thing, it's very mysterious, and our healthcare, as I called it in my book, Unlock Congress, our healthcare non system is a problem. Regardless of presidential response and taking Trump to task, we're not set up for this. We're not set up for this. That, that part, he, he is right about in some ways. And I think, you know, it's, now the, the second thing is that our banking system's not been hacked. I, I shell shocked that that hasn't happened. And I actually think it's almost like nuclear mutually assured destruction. I think under countries can do it to us, but if they know they start down that road, I mean, remember when the Korean leader, we made fun of him in a movie here, he hacked Sony the next day. Yeah. So, um, so, so talk, talk about that. Uh, 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 are you surprised that this, you know, you, in a way you and I were saying offline that 
almost been waiting for something like this to happen. We have, and you know what? If you, uh, it, it's out there on, on, on the internet right now. If you Google Bill Gates TED Talk from I think three or four years ago, he is saying exactly this. And I and I'll and I'll paraphrase what he said in his TED Talk. But essentially, it's look, our next threat is not a world war. It's not a regional war. It's not a crisis in the Middle East or an oil crisis. It's a it's a pandemic that's going to be spread because of a virus millions, thousands, if not millions of people will die. This is Bill Gates saying this four or five years ago in a TED Talk. And yes, he's a very smart man, but it doesn't take necessarily that smart of a person to realize that is a big threat. And we're finally living it and we're going through it. And it's such a check, especially in America. Internationally, there's a little more of an understanding of life isn't so perfect. In America, life is pretty perfect for the most part, generally speaking. But now this is a real gut check and a real reality check of us waiting. At some point here, when we talk about California being the canary in the coal mine, at some point here in California, there will be a time in the next couple of weeks, perhaps what they say, you know what, Mondays, this city gets to go shopping. Tuesdays, this city gets to go shopping. And it won't be this you know, just be judicial, go out when you can. It's going to be some real hard and fast rules. So I think it's a real, it's, it's just a fascinating experience what we're going through. And yes, what you say, it's not surprising, but it is surprising because most of us don't expose ourselves and read so deep and watch so many TED Talks where we really take it to heart because we've had no reason to really doubt anything, right, in the last 50 years. Yeah, it's sort of, it's that phrase, I flip them, I get them confused, but surprising, not shocking, or shocking, not surprising. I mean, of course, it's a shock to the system, and we're not, yes, and I'll tell you something. First of all, I'm sure like me, and I'm sure you know, like most of us, we know people working in healthcare, we know nurses, we know doctors. It is infuriating to me that these people are not supplied with protective gear, first for their own lives, but secondly, just out of logic. It is. And that lives. comes into when President Trump does, does, when he does say, you know what, I inherited the system. That is true. It, from President Obama to President Clinton to President Bush, this has just been a failed system. And now we are exposed that we cannot simply go. And yes, if you're a famous basketball player or a politician or a, an actor, you can go out and get tested right now, right away, even if you're asymptomatic. But you know, for the most part, me and you can't. We have to be in that vulnerable population. We have to be 70 plus. We have to have underlying conditions for us to even get tested. That shouldn't be the case. That'll be resolved, but that's not gonna be resolved for another really four to six weeks. And that's gonna be a lot of time and a lot of injuries and perhaps some death toll before we get there. It, it, for sure. And, and the reason that I was bringing that up is that setting aside the personal anger or disappointment that we feel about that, the other piece of this is everybody just staying at home. And it's not a natural thing. And, and you know, you were talking about the world, you know, the greatest generation. I never loved that term because it ignores the Vietnam generation and so forth. But the point is that in our lifetimes, we haven't had one moment of national sacrifice where it was required. And I think it's incredibly ironic, almost comic, that, that anybody would complain about staying home for a few weeks. The problem is the loss in pay and your you know, the jobs and the economy and so That's forth. That's the real complaint. But, but this, is, you know, this is not that tall in order for people to get off the beach and stay home and keep six feet of distance. Don't, don't you think that, I mean, if that's the biggest thing that we have to do as civilians who aren't in the military and aren't on the front lines of healthcare, it's not that extraordinary a sacrifice, am I, I wrong? It, it's not, and I do believe, and this is not a false bravado or a false faith, I do have a lot of faith in this culture and this society that we will adopt that. But this is new to us, so it can't just be done, boom, in yeah. one week. It's going to take a few days, a couple of weeks to get on board. And I think it's, we're doing a pretty good job. When I go out, we went out for our daily walk just a, a couple hours ago with my family. We saw plenty of people. We kept our distance. We say hello. We still want to be friendly. Self-isolation doesn't mean social isolation. Right. Meaning you know, we, we can still say hello. We can still talk like we are right now. But I think we are getting on board pretty quickly. And we'd see this, the, you know, the national media talking about the spring break kids down in Florida. That's all going to change. Yeah. This, is, this is just the first week out. Yes, for California, it's our second week. But for everyone else, welcome to the party, so to speak. It's going to happen. This is a country of action. And we just have to take our energy and now do action at home, whether it's donating our supplies, donating our money, or donating our brain power. We can do a country of action, but it's just going to have to be at home unless you're an essential employee. And gosh, I just, 
I just want to thank everyone. Oh, yeah. People that do have to go out and work, journalists included, but we're, we're, the, we're the bottom there. Just the, the cashiers and the cooks and the first responders and people who are going out there without the necessary medical equipment. It is remarkable, and we, have, we owe such a big uh, gratitude to them. Absolutely, and actually on the socialization front, I just remembered Faith Soros, Faith, Faith Sidlow uh, uh, from our days at NBC, she's in town and she's in Sun City West, which is about 40 minutes from here. And, you know, I'm probably gonna drive out there tomorrow and we're gonna walk for, you know, an hour, five feet apart and just talk and, you know, it's, yeah. what, what, you know. Uh, what, let me ask you what you said on giving back and, and helping those folks on the front lines. You're in one of the biggest cities. Um, and again, the Northern California and of course, California, I always say the Golden State sets the pace, you know, back from just banning smoking, everything usually, a lot of policy things happen in California before the rest of the country. So in Northern California, when, where people want to help, what are you guys on the air telling them that they can do other, other than stay in place and not be hoarding when they go out to supply themselves? Uh, there's a couple of just entry level things that you can do um, just to help the, the, our neighbors and friends. Uh, in terms of eating and dining, we all love our local restaurants. Go out and if you feel uncomfortable eating or taking out, you can't even dine in, buy a gift card. Go to your, call your restaurant and say, you know what, I've been coming to you for two years or 20 years. Here's $100, give me a gift card, I'll use it a year from now. That's one small way of doing it. If you're fortunate to have maid service to come to your home or gardeners come to your home, still pay them. Tell them not to come. In fact, they're non-essential employees, so they're not going to come. But still pay them if you can. If you can't, look, I get it. But those are some small things that we're doing here uh, in the Bay Area. And remember, when we say Bay Area, specifically where I am, Santa Clara County, which is the Silicon Valley, Stanford University, San Jose, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Google headquarters. So we are the hardest hit county among the hardest hit counties in the country. So we are really in the hot zone here. So when we go out, it is, we're keeping our distance. And I've been speaking these last couple of weeks to several people who have COVID-19. And one of their frustrations is, you know what, the six feet, forget about it. It should be 12 feet. Because if I'm walking on a trail or on my street or on the, or on the beach and someone six feet or eight feet ahead of me sneezes or coughs, it's gonna to come to me, I'm gonna walk right into it. So these are from patients who are going through this right now saying, you know what, Raj, please, when you go on air, and I, initially I was saying six feet is great, but now we're telling everyone, you know what, six feet is minimum. Try to make it 10 to 12 feet if you're even gonna be in a public space at all. And another thing we're saying is on your daily walk, and please, you should take your daily walk, on your daily walk or exercise, if you're seeing more than 15 or 20 people on that walk, you're walking in the wrong spot. Right. Try to get to another spot. Yeah. Um, no, no, that's, look, it's all new. Like you said, they've, they've, even the doctors, even the health professionals, even Tony Fauci, they're figuring it out as they go. And, uh, and, and it, in a heroic fashion, I would say, let me segue slightly. I don't want to get too much into politics, but you're a worldly guy. And I want to ask you a question about, you've traveled a great deal. You grew up uh, for a time in India. Um, in fact, Trivandrum, is that where you, am I pronouncing that right? You are. Trivandrum is the, the British way. Now, if you want to real get ethnic, it's Thitter Van Thumperum. I won't, I won't hold you to it. Trivandrum is <laughs> we're going we're gonna to take a pass on that, but that's where you, that's where you were born in India. Um, before I ask you a question about this country and immigration and, and our role in the world, I, I want to let folks know, Raj has, has, has carried, he's run with the Olympic torch three times, three times. And I remember when, the first time when we were both in California, First of all, I don't know how you got to do that three times, but so, so tell us how that happened and also what that feels like. People try to imagine before Raj's answers, when you're watching this on television and you're watching the relay and it's something the Muhammad Ali's, they say, iconic image of being the last with the torch, but this is this, this, this sort of, uh, uh, um, what's it called, baton, you know. You're passing the baton, you, you, you pass that Olympic torch to each what's other. What's that you, like? You each other's flame. It's phenomenal. It, it's the, it's it's got to be one of the biggest honors of my lifetime and, and most thrilling days. How have I ran it three times? Yeah. It's a little Forrest Gump in me. I just happen to be there every time. I've been with NBC, as you know, for, for my whole career. That's 25 years uh, at various spots of NBC. And the first time in Arizona, they said, Raj, would you mind running the torch? It's coming right through Arizona. I was, of course, what a great honor. Then I was here in San Francisco, and it's come through twice here. 
Um, and now I've become just kind of like, okay, he's, he's an Olympic guy. I've been and covered seven Olympic games. And it's just, it's such an honor, and especially for an international person like me, born in another country, having a green card, becoming a citizen in 1995. Uh, it, it's, it's, it takes that much, it's that much more of an impact to me. Um, it's, and when I go to the Olympics, I don't know if I've told you this before, but I've been to seven, and each time I go, every time, without fail, there is a point in those three weeks where I'm walking down, whether it's in London or Athens or Vancouver or Salt Lake City, wherever it is, I'll walk down the road or walk into a, a venue, and I will, I will break down in tears because just seeing the people come together is phenomenal. It is one of the best moments you can experience. And I hope you can see that on television when you're watching the Olympics. But I know, trust me, when you're in person and you hear different cultures and languages, you smell different foods, and yet everyone's there together, not talking about politics, it's phenomenal. And I can't wait for these next Olympics. I don't think Tokyo is going to happen, Michael. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm supposed to go uh, in mid-July. I, I don't, I, and I hope it doesn't happen because I think it's too much pressure and too many people will be put at risk. Yeah, yeah, Shinzo Abe's got a decision to make. I imagine it's coming soon. Uh, and I think that they'll, it's, I, I, the, what they built is, I heard, unbelievable. So it's a shame. Uh, so wait, let me, um, you know, it's, it, before I get back to that, that question about America's role, you, 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 you said something that ties into your background and your career that I'd love to ask you about when you get that emotional and you're seeing all those people from those different cultures, it, it's a reminder that, and you covered sports for 15 of the years, at least before you went full throttle into news. Sports is unique that way. It has a unique way to bring people together and get past all the other clutter that, that, you know, that gets in the way of people connecting. So talk about your experience covering sports. Um, and, and how important that is right now. I mean, it's, it's a shame the Olympics won't go on because that's one of those things that binds us together, right? Yeah, you remember, you know, after September 11th, after all sorts of tragedies, whether it's a stock market crash or a, or, or a crisis or a Vietnam War, sports is the one thing that usually is there for us. Yeah. And it's when we can actually sit down now and watch something, you know, watch the 49ers or watch the Cowboys or watch the Pistons and Lakers, whatever it is, that's what we don't have now. So that makes this even more extraordinary. And what I loved about sports and still love about sports, and I don't, I don't reveal this actually to too many people, is when I covered sports actively every night as my main job, I honestly didn't care much about the score or Barry Bonds batting average or even how many home runs he hit. In fact, I traveled with Barry Bonds, followed him around the country many years ago during the home run chase. I still couldn't tell you what, what off the top of my head. I would have to look at my notes. What was the single season again, home run? What was the, was it 762, the over? I don't know. I love the story. Story, That's the personal. I love. The personal. I, love, I love the personal story. I love what he did, uh, not just him. I love what athletes do to bring us together. Um, I love what the effect they have in the community. That's what I love. The score is, is the last thing. Oh, by the way, the 49ers beat the Cowboys. Oh, by the way, the Blackhawks beat the Stars. That's the end. That's the tagline for me. The front, middle, and the whole body of it is, wow, look at what this event is doing or just did to us. Look at how we were twisted in our stomachs and our excitement and our tears and our anger, whatever. And then, oh, by the way, here's the score. And, and that's what I love about sports. It, it's just about humanity and community. Yeah, no, and, 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 and inspiration. And you and I had something in common uh, style-wise when we were reporters, even though I was news and you were sports. We both love doing feature stories. We both love going out and telling somebody's story and using music and creativity and, and, and the words and pictures to do that. In sports, there's just always great stories. Um, you, just, you just have to find them. And obviously, 10 Emmys, you're, you're, you're great at doing that. I, I want to get back one question about sort of America's place in the world right now. You know, obviously immigration has been an incredibly contentious issue for longer than Trump's been president, but obviously even more fraught the last three and a half years. Um, but setting aside that issue as a you know domestic issue, right now with the virus, with 
with what happened in China, what's ha still happening in Italy, and, I, and for people who don't know, they're still not doing this right in Italy. And they acknowledge that. And, and a couple provinces uh, 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 that did it right, they held these numbers down. Uh, but leading to my question, which is that usually when something like this happens, Raj, America is the centerpiece. We take a lead role in coordinating responses, especially with our allies. We're not doing that right now. And that is a result of, of this president's decisions. And I know you don't uh, like to get political, but I'm wondering, especially as someone who's traveled a lot, someone who grew up in another country, you know, people who've just lived in America don't really see how other countries look at America. Um, and so I'm wondering, what do you think of the way, I won't make it central to the president, even though he's the leader of our country, but that we've not engaged in that same way thus far the last, the last six weeks in this crisis. No, it's been a problem. And this is not a political statement. It's a factual statement. We can go back, you can Google it right now and look at President Trump's response six weeks ago, five weeks ago, four, three, two, as soon as last week is, is, is recent as just you know, eight days ago saying, you know what, this is no big deal, we will get over this, COVID-19 is not a problem, stock market's gonna be great, we're all gonna be great. That's not a political statement, that's just factual that he dealt right. with. In his private time, he could maybe saying this is a, a huge problem, but publicly he was telling whoever listened to him, this was not a big deal. And following suit, Fox News, which is often a mouthpiece for the president, also followed suit. So. A lot of people watch Fox. It's the number one news network, cable news network. Mm -hmm. So all those people up until just a couple of weeks ago were getting the message that it's not a big deal. So that's damaging. And that's not a political statement. That is damaging. Um, now we're playing catch up and hopefully we can catch up in this. We had Leon Panetta on just a, a day ago on NBC. Yeah, and, and he was saying, look, we need to now focus on what we're doing today and tomorrow. Yes, yesterday hurt us meaning these last few weeks hurt us, and the president's response. The president is responding now. I will say that. He is working with Governor Gavin Newsom here, and both of them are saying nice things about each other. Yeah. Never happened. Yeah. But that has to happen. Yeah. And that's the leadership we need from President Trump, which he's showing now, at least in some capacity. And from Gavin Newsom, our governor here, they are working together because that's the only way we can get California out of this. And again, we are the canary in the coal mine. If we do it right, everyone will follow suit. Yeah, and, and, and all of that I agree with. Um, and I'm not gonna go into uh, you know, the, the detail. Uh, I mean, you can, there's a video going now where you can see what the president said every day for six weeks. I've seen it, and, and it's, it's something that we, we've seen and we've heard, and he's, he's finally changing his tune for the most part, and that's what we need. Um, uh, and in terms uh, of just the, the international scope of it, what, what's happened here a few years ago in America is now we're seeing a lot of politicians in that similar ilk, whether it's Brazil, whether it's India, whether it's in, in Europe, of just that nationalistic style. This is what's going on in the world right now, as you know. Yeah, and that's the thing. I, 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 beyond the local, I, what I meant more so is, do you do you see it? Look, China now they're sending supplies everywhere else, and you know it kind of appears like almost an exercise of guilt uh, for how they handled this. But the point China is also it should be noted, China mishandled it. They did not oh, yeah. report the proper numbers. They delayed in reporting, depending who you believe, and it's hard to get factual reporting out of there, especially now with the New York Times and Washington Post reporters kicked yeah. out of China. It's hard, but I, I, there's a pretty good odds, and this is coming from experts, not me, that they underreported the numbers. Yep. They did not report in time. They let people travel freely several weeks after this. So we are also trying to catch up and make good on what China has done in terms of spreading this. There's no question, but at the same time, the United States usually is at the fore. President Obama, when it was Ebola, he sent teams to Africa. He's, he, he to, to get in front of it, there, there was proactive uh, action. I'm not just talking in our country. I'm talking with regard to the world. And that's usually what America does. And I fear that there's, there's a void right now. The president did not even let allies 
uh, uh, allied countries know in uh, European alleys that we were shutting down the, the air travel. He did not even apprise them. They found out on the news or on Twitter. And, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes that's okay. People over overshoot the importance of that when it comes to uh, Donald Trump, uh, President Trump. But when it comes to something like this, people, these countries expect America to lead. And if we don't, it also, don't you think I'm asking this question, it changes the order of the world. It changes how countries look and perceive the United States, no? It sure does. And two things here, whether it's, even if President Obama was in office now, because we didn't know the actual effect and magnitude of it from China, perhaps he wouldn't have sent help there because we didn't know about it. That's if President Obama was in charge. President Trump, as you know, that's not his, this is not his calling card. His calling card is not, President uh, Obama was a citizen of the world in right. theory. President Trump is a citizen of the U.S., and that's the way, he, that's what he campaigns on to this day. He worries about our borders. Everything is us-centric. And so that's his calling card politically. So that's where he's going to go. So that's not, not a surprise. But even if it were President Obama, I'm not sure we could act globally because we just didn't know until it was too late. Last question, my friend. I said that for a number of years you were in sports. You were great at it. It's amazing. You you anchor three shows, three oh. newscasts a night, and, and you just you just jumped headfirst into news several years ago uh, in San Francisco. What's it like? Well, first of all, it's a two part question. What's it like having a career like this in your home city? Because in broadcasting, that's sort of the dream for a lot of folks. They, we move up in the markets and you get back to your city, especially if the top five markets. Very hard to do. You did it at a young age. And, uh, you know, Raj is a humble guy, but he's a celebrity in San Francisco. That's r ridiculous. But the second part, e even more importantly, under these circumstances, you know, local news gets a rough rap. And believe me, I'm the one dishing it up, as you know, uh, uh, frequently. But what's it like now and, and, and the value of it? that you can see in real time where you guys are communicating local information every day, every hour with social media uh, to, to a, a large part of California. I can't tell you the importance of local news right now. It, it, is, it is life and death. It's a lifeline. Um, national news cannot even access where we are. You can't send a reporter from New York or LA even to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, because you can't get off flights. It's not safe. NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, they're not going to do that unless someone's already here. So locally, whether it's Phoenix, Bay Area, Chicago, New York, you have to rely on your local reporters. And I couldn't be more proud to work for a company or a station here that has just built a trust level. We have never tried to do rating stunts. We've never tried to be uh, pull off you know, things that just aren't factually true, journalistically true. Uh, I've never been more proud and more timely to work for a local news outfit. And I said this before, uh, this is the story we've been working on, we've been preparing for, yeah. for decades. Our entire career, for me, and I speak for a lot of my colleagues, this is what we've been working for. And Michael, this is what you've been working towards in terms of preparing for this moment, that story of a generation. And yes, you're in a different platform now, but you are still very engaged. You're not doing local news or national news, but you are preparing. You're treating this journalistically and analyzing what's happening politically and health-wise and economically. And that's what we're doing now. And so for the people you trust, the reporters, the newspapers, the websites you trust, this is critical information. It's a great answer. And, and, you know, I remember the earthquake during the World Series. And I remember Al Michaels, who he was not a news guy, but he's a brilliant communicator. And when that happened, I think it was during the game. Uh, and, and this was, God, so many years ago now, but his, you could tell his skills as a broadcaster, even though he wasn't, uh, uh, you know, you just spring to it. And so, like you said, now I do more opinion journalism and writing and, 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 and this kind of stuff. Um, and, and writing is more important than ever now when you do it because every word matters and you need to be careful. And, uh, you know, th th this is just, it's such a big topic. Oh, I think um, I just lost you for a moment. Yeah, that's okay. I think that you're, I think that you're coming back. You're, you're frozen on my screen. Hopefully we get back here. <laughs>
That's all right. I'll 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 fill. I'm good at that. There's oh, there's, there's, there's that good luck in the mayor. I'm the mayor, so mayor Raj, Raj Mathai. Uh, no, no, you're absolutely right. And nobody ever nobody ever wants to, to to deal with a story like this. But there's no question that if you're in journalism, opinion journalism, or straight news, you have been preparing for this, and it's 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 something to devour in terms of uh, reporting on it, communicating opinion. And I, I bet I bet people in, in the Bay Area really appreciate this right now. Are you getting a feel for that? I, I'm getting the feel, whether it's from my social media feeds, whether it's me in person taking a walk or people reach out to, to me. And then to be more crude, yes, just watching our ratings. Our ratings are through the roof because people need this. Yeah. And you said something interesting uh, when you talk about kind of shock jock or sensational or opinion journalism, there's a fine line here. Many of those people aren't prepared, not everyone, many aren't prepared for real journalism. Yeah. This is real journalism. What we're doing is real journalism. We're not here for the ratings. Yes, I work for NBC. My bosses perhaps are there for the ratings, but we are here to, to, to get the news across fast, accurately, with compassion and with intelligence because people's livelihoods are depending on this. So when we are there live every night, we're there, we're on it. We have teams of people. And what we're doing now, we're starting to set up all our, our studios remotely because at some point, 40 people in that NBC newsroom could be on quarantine and we're gonna have to rely on everyone else. So uh, here I've had a little outdoor uh, setup for my news. I might be anchoring our NBC news from my home uh, beginning in a week or two with the printer, a producer, a camera, and we are ready to go from my home. And I'm the lead anchor. And that's 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 11 p.m. news. We are setting that up actively because look, we're not, we're not silly here. At some point, the NBC newsroom will be infected to a small degree, hopefully. Hopefully it's not a big degree. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, look, this, this is happening so fast that, it, you know, in two days, some of the, the, the details of what you and I are talking about will be uh, dated already. But just several days ago, Anderson Cooper, they put lights on him in his home uh, because one of his staff, you know, uh, was at risk. And by the way, I love watching journalists and you are, you, you have always been amazing ad-libbing and just speaking extemporaneously, but you can really, you can, you can tell the gold from the chaff now when you watch the national broadcasters when, they, when they're without a teleprompter and they're just having to speak. Um, but, but, and, and, and look, Rand Paul, like just, just came down with this thing. Yes. Senator Rand Paul, and they said that potentially he was in a swimming pool public. I mean, this is, we've never experienced anything like it. Listen. No, uh, and really, hey, one thing, uh, one thing that I even told our newsroom the other day, hey, when someone notable that's famous gets it, it shouldn't be, oh my gosh, this person have it. it, it the tone's got to be, you know what? This person has it. Right. In California, the projection is 56% of us are going to get infected. So we can't sit there and run to the hillside every day someone gets it. It's got to be just Michael Golden, Raj Vatha. Yep, they have it now too. It's just, it's 56%. It, I, you it's, know what? And I'm so it, it's not a bad thing to have it. It's something that we're there, we're concerned for, but a lot of us are going to get it. I, for sure. And I was so glad to see uh, G Governor Newsom do that when he did. And then, you know, the, because I've been writing articles for days, ripping the New I don't like ripping the sitting governor of New York. Who am I to do that? But I could not understand. This is simple math. You, you, <laughs> four to five people, they, they, they said in, uh, in China, got the disease from somebody they didn't know who didn't have it. You have to, you have to shut it down. It, only in order so that you don't have to have it shut down for so long. Let everybody have a chance to get it or find out if they have it and let the virus run its course. It, it, it's just so commonsensical to me that it's driving me nuts because still, I still believe as you and I are sitting here on a Sunday talking about this, March 22nd, I still believe that this needs to be nationalized. You can't do it state by state. People are crossing state lines. State lines don't care about it. These are random when it comes to germs. It's ridiculous. Uh, listen, this is your day off. I don't want to hold you any longer. You and I, uh, uh, this is about the most serious conversation we've had in a little <laughs> Usually we're, we're, made, we're doing movie lines over the phone. And, uh, yeah. this well, is, but, but, look, but look where we are. This is, uh, again, this is once in a generation. This is our generation's challenge. I think we will meet it. Um, and, and Michael, I hope everyone listening and watching just uh, stays healthy and stays optimistic because uh, whoop, this too shall pass. Uh, but hopefully we can just uh, limit the damage. Well, this is your day off, and uh, and I'm sure that you're you're. It's not really a day off. So the fact that you took 30 minutes uh, to to do this with me, 
Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Raj Mathai out in San Francisco or San Juan, San, 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 San uh, Los Altos is my Los, town. <laughs> Los Altos, but I was, I don't know why I get San Juan. I get that confused with, there's a lot of sands in uh, San Bernardino. There's a lot of sands in California. Welcome to California, the Mission Trail. <laughs> you know what? I miss it. I miss that state. I love living there. I miss all you friends. Uh, Faith says hello. We're going to, we're going to take a walk tomorrow. And like you said, maybe we'll elongate it to 12 feet apart and, you know, but uh, thanks for taking the time to do this, my friend. I love you. Best to your family and, and, and keep doing what you're doing. We need it. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you soon on the Golden Mean.